Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Canada, and good morning and evening, depending on where you are on this small planet. We are here again for another GWF core modeling thematical webinar. Today's webinar is about geospatial intelligence. Uh, this team uh, mainly focuses on three areas. One is model configurations and workflow, process-based parameter inference and estimation, and model evaluation and benchmarking. Today, we have Professor Martin Clark from University of Saskatchewan and Associate Director of Center of Hydrology in Canmore. Martin is a well-recognized scientist uh, with over 200 uh, journal publications. Uh, his research interests uh, match exactly with uh, this team from GWF, Geospatial Intelligence. And uh, from my personal perspective, as I'm involved in uh, some of the work in this team, I'm very excited to see the development and advancement here. Uh, finally, and before we start, I would like to thank you for being here on behalf of GWF Core Modeling Management Team, Al Petroniro, Martin Clark, Joy Mitsujiani, and me, myself, and I, Shavon Harari. Martin, floor is yours, please. Excellent, thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, as Shervan mentioned, we're going to um, race through a few topics today. We'll have a bit of an introduction. Um, we'll talk about model workflows. I think this is the area where we've made the most progress um, over the last year. Um, talk a little bit about parameter estimation, a lot of good progress there also um, um, with the efforts from the PCIP group that I'll talk about. Um, some of the work on model evaluation, and then I'll um, sum up at the end. Um, so to start with, I wanted to um, talk about, you know, what we're doing, um, what our focus is in geospatial intelligence is really on enabling discoveries. So I've got a, got a photo here. I thought this would be a fun thing to show, you know, pre-COVID. A um, few people in the room that we might recognize. There's John Pomeroy um, sitting at the front, as he, as he always did. Kevin Shook, you know, in the foreground there. There's um, Saman Razavi, who's um, having a sip of coffee after his rousing introduction of the guest speaker. This is when Bart Nyson came to Saskatoon. And um, Bart was asked to talk in the Breakthroughs in Water Security series that was organized by Jeff McDonnell. And um, Bart's topic was breakthroughs and process-based hydrological modeling. You know, we got started and then he said, well, you know, breakthroughs are kind of rare. You know, if we're lucky, we might have one breakthrough per career or, you know, two breakthroughs per career may be a good batting average. You know, what we're really doing is enabling breakthroughs in process-based hydrological modeling. And I, um, I really think that that's what we're doing in the geospatial intelligence theme. We're um, really trying to build the computational infrastructure um, that can support a lot of people and their modeling activities in order to make the modeling activities of other groups across core modeling more effective and more efficient. What we're interested in is the spatial representation of the landscape. So we can slice and dice the landscape in different ways. And often, you know, we have a hierarchical spatial structure that enables representing um, um, the spatial organization of um, many, many existing models. Um, so this is just a picture that I had from my 2015 paper saying that we can have um, hydrological response units um, that are nested within grouped response units and the HAUs and the, and the GAUs can be of any size and shape, um, giving us um, a huge amount of flexibility in the way that we represent the dominant hydrological processes. Um, this can be applied on continental domains. Um, this is a figure um, from um, uh, some of the work from Walter Knurben, um, showing his um, application of the SUMA model across the North American continent. Here we've got about, you know, half a million um, model elements, um, running the model for 40 years of hourly simulations. And, you know, to do a model simulation like this actually requires a lot of effort. Um, you have to discretize um, the spatial domain, um, in this case, we discretize it into sub-basins and we have to um, process the meteorological data, the land use data, um, um, get that um, working in our models, um, get the code to run, um, calibrate the models, analyze and visualize the model output, et cetera. And then um, building all of that computational infrastructure in a way where the experimental outcomes can lead to new scientific insights and or management decisions. Um, 
Um, and um, what we see, you know, when we're building models like this is that we've got similar data requirements across multiple models. Um, so we talked about, you know, the catchments and the Merit Hydro database that we're using, um, the data requirements that we have that are common across models, are the topographic parameters, the soil parameters, vegetation land use parameters, the forcing data, how we deal with the river network, etc. So we can, there's a lot of work that we can do to um, um, pull together information in a model agnostic way that um, can support the application of multiple hydrological models. And um, the key challenge, of course, the key scientific challenge, of course, is spatial scaling. Um, so how do we develop parameterizations that represent the aggregate impact of subgrid to scale heterogeneities? There's different methods for that. Um, I'm not going to call them out so much, um, but uh, where we can explicitly represent the spatial variability or we can um, implicitly represent the spatial variability um, through upscale parameter values, new flux parameterizations, subgrid probability distributions, et cetera. And um, the, the way that we handle the spatial scaling um, can, can affect um, the quality of our model results. So as we're moving forward, I wanted to talk about some of the advances that we've had in model, model workflows. A key theme that you'll see here is um, going agnostic, is that we're focusing more on the community of practice, um, developing um, advances in community hydrological modeling um, so that um, the advances are applicable across multiple models rather than pushing the development of a single um, community hydrological model. Um, huge focus on reproducible science. Um, so the global network data sets that we use are Merit Hydro, and, um, and I've showed this um, slide before, but I want to show it again to show the spatial detail that we have when we're um, zooming into local regions. Here we're um, zooming in um, to um, the Saskatchewan River Basin, um, and um, the Bow River above Calgary is highlighted there in magenta. And there's a version of it um, and highlighting the, um, Bow, but the Bow River above Calgary and then um, the Bow River above Banff. Um, the average size of the catchments that we have here is about like um, 30 square kilometers. And then um, in the workflows that we've developed, we can um, further discretize each of these river basins um, into elevation bands, aspect classes, um, vegetation classes, et cetera. And of course, you know, similar workflows are used across um, other models. Um, this is an example of a mesh um, um, draped over the landscape, a triangular mesh draped over the landscape um, um, with variable resolution in order to um, represent topography and vegetation. Um, this is um, one of the things that Chris Marsh has developed in the Canadian hydrology model. When we're moving through the different steps here, we're thinking about the basin delineation, the digital elevation data, the soils data, the vegetation data, meteorological data, processing of the river networks, is that there's um, a lot of tasks here, um, but only a few of the tasks are model specific. Um, so um, what Vout has been doing when he's been developing this workflow is to carefully separate out um, the model agnostic tasks from the model specific tasks um, so that he can develop a modular workflow that's applicable um, across multiple modeling communities. Um, and the key things here is that we're all configuring our models in different ways, um, but these models have got um, similar data requirements and there's a lot that we can do to unify the way that we configure our hydrological models. Um, so the goal here is for reproducible and shareable workflows which is good scientific practice, easier to keep track of the work for reporting and paper reviews, easier to collaborate and potentially large efficiency gains. And we're seeing some of this in the Global Water Futures Program. Um, what I'm showing here is a um, provocative article. Um, um, and our very own Jim Freer was a co-author on this article um, that was published a few years ago. And that's asking the question, um, um, if most computational hydrology is not reproducible, is it really science? And this is part of the push um, towards much more reproducibility in the way that um, we do our modeling work um, so that other people can follow more effectively in our footsteps. 
Vout is arguing that we can improve on highly specific model workflows by recognizing that our models have got fairly similar data needs. And um, he's got a quote here um, um, from a paper that was published recently that um, most land models solve a variant of the coupled conservation equations for thermodynamics and hydrology for the subdomains of the canopy airspace, vegetation, snow and soil. Um, so um, models are solving the same equations, the models have got similar data requirements and there's, um, there's a lot more that we can do um, to um, pull information together um, from different modeling groups. So what Valter has done is um, build a modeling workflow that separates the model agnostic and the model specific steps. Um, the scope of his workflow is really focused on um, the data preparation um, to pre prepare accelerate data on geospatial parameter fields, prepare the forcing data, um, set up the models um, to convert input data into simulations, generating the simulations, visualization analysis. Everything that Vout is doing is in this um, blue box here. What Vout is not doing is focusing on how um, the landscape is discretized into model elements and um, how the model is calibrated or how the um, parameter values in the model are estimated. So the goal here is completely reproducible and reusable code. So I mentioned that I'm separating the model agnostic and model specific tasks, focusing on ease of reuse, um, modularity to encourage adaptation. What Vout has done is, is treated um, the modeling tasks um, more as a um, smorgasbord um, than a plated meal. Um, so if people um, want, some, want some code to process the topography data, process the river network data, et cetera, they can just um, pick and choose from that workflow. And he's also developed in a way that the outcomes are traceable. Um, the paper has now been submitted. Um, so the paper is submitted to Water Resources Research and um, it's, um, it's available um, on a preprint archive if you'd like to see what's done. Um, the paper itself is a, um, a little bit more philosophical in nature, talking about you know, what we need to do as a community. And um, we've included some co-authors there who have contributed um, to that debate, including um, Jared Bales um, from Quasi, um, um, David Tarbottom um, from, um, from Utah State and Bart Nyson, University of Washington and Andy Wood um, from ENCA um, to further that debate. Um, the other co-authors here are, are part of the Global Water Futures Program. Everything here is open access. All of the code is available on GitHub and um, it's um, nicely organized um, with code directories and data directories um, to make it, make it easy to navigate. Uh, so I mentioned before, this is, this is really pushing forward um, the paradigm of community modeling, not community models. Um, so there's kind of too much in here to really go through, um, but I want to emphasize that, you know, we're starting with um, data specific input layers with a series of tasks, um, um, model agnostic output layers where you're taking that specific data and um, providing it in a form um, that can be usable for models, um, data agnostic processing layer, model agnostic output layer, model specific processing layer and model specific output layer. Um, um, to begin to push forward uh, how we're um, um, separating out these different um, processing tasks. So this is enabling um, fully reproducible modeling at, at, we say all scales, um, and we're going down to pretty fine scales, but it's um, at, um, multiple spatial scales that we're interested in when we're applying our model um, across a continental domain. Um, Go Chang has been um, standing on Vouter's shoulders and beginning to apply this workflow um, for global applications. So um, the study area here is all global land areas except um, Greenland and Antarctica. And, and, and those, you know, the hydrological simulations are less meaningful um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so the discretization um, for the globe is also based on um, the merit basins um, from um, this is the discretization of merit hydro, the spatial discretization of merit hydro um, that was done by Perung Lin and Ming Pan, who both at the time were at Princeton. 
Um, it's using the merit hydrologically adjusted um, digital elevation model. Um, it's, I'm just going to go through these slides quickly. It's using um, the MODIS land cover data. Um, we've got um, the land cover you know, in, in different classes here. Um, it's using the soil grids, um, soil class um, globally. Um, it's um, remapping um, the topographic and land data to the modeling units. So all of the modeling's done um, for the Merit Hydro Basins. And Gochang's using Shirvan's um, Easy More, the Earth System Modeling Remapper tool, um, a tool in, in Python that many of us in Global Water Futures are, are using um, to map um, from one unstructured grid um, to another unstructured grid. Here's an example of here um, how we're going from um, 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 a, a grid um, to basins and the, the mapping from grid to basins. And you know this type of um, of remapping is you know quite. A common exercise in earth system modeling applications where we've got different different models running on different geospatial structures. Um, and the meteorological forcing data for this, um, Go Chung is using his own data, the EM Earth um, um, data set, which is an ensemble of um, precipitation and um, temperature that's um, developed across the globe. Um, this was recently published in um, the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And I'm not really focusing on the science here. I've got a couple of slides here. Um, Go Chang's science question is to understand um, how uncertainties in the meteorological forcing data um, propagate through to uncertainties in the hydrological model simulations. Um, the main thing that I wanted to focus here for this um, a geospatial intelligence theme is um, is to um, talk about you know the workflow elements you know how they're being developed and how they're now applicable on the global scale. I can't resist though showing a showing a couple of slides. Um, so here's a slide on um, the um, the streamflow uncertainty. So what Go Chang's showing here is um, the mean runoff and um, the um, mean runoff un uncertainty ratio, which is, um, which is the ratio of um, the, ensembles, the ensemble spread um, the, um, to the mean runoff. Um, this is um, how it looks um, globally. And Go Cheng's got some, um, got some examples here as to you know, some, of, um, some of the key, um, key results here. And one of the key results that I want to focus on here is that um, a lot of the uncertainty is reduced. Um, meteorological uncertainty is reduced in um, snow melt dominated river basins um, where um, individual precipitation, the uncertainty and in individual precipitation events can cancel each other out you know, as we're moving throughout the um, moving throughout the accumulation season. Um, um, Shervan has been working on um, incorporating lakes and reservoirs in the vector-based routing model. A lot of this work is you know, based on um, geospatial based on the geospatial intelligence work. Um, so the routing model that we've been using is Miseroute. Um, it's a vector-based routing model um, for applications across multiple spatial scales suitable for local, regional, and global applications. Um, the um, key thing about Miseroute is that um, it's part of the Earth System Community Modeling Portal. So Miseroute is incorporated within the Community Earth System Model. Um, there's a lot of recent work that we've talked about in um, previous presentations on the parallelization um, of Miseroute um, based on the spatial decomposition of um, the river network topology in a hierarchical way. Now that's, that was published already last year. Um, the land surface um, simulations um, can be model agnostic, so Miseroute can accept runoff um, from any land model, um, and EasyMore can be used um, to, um, to map the runoff um, um, from a land model um, to the basins um, that, are, that are used in Miseroute. Um, and Shivan has spent a lot of time um, developing multiple multi-model lakes and reservoir representations, um, the time invariant parametric model, and the dole and hype, the time variant parametric model, Hanasake data-driven approaches representing endorheic lakes, etc. Um, Trish talked about a lot of that in her presentation a month ago. 
Um, what I want to focus on here is the um, the geospatial analysis that has been done um, to make this possible at the global scale. What I'm what I'm showing here now is the global application of Miserout um, with lakes, and um, the um, um, Ushavan's um, zooming in here in um, the South Saskatchewan River Basin, which um, in this implementation using HDMA has got seven resolved lakes and reservoirs. As we move to higher resolution network topologies, um, we can resolve um, um, more and more lakes and reservoirs. Um, the darker color that we're getting in this network plot here is, um, is representing that there's a higher impact of reservoirs um, on, on the stream flow. Um, so shervan has got a paper um, that's in preparation at the moment um, that hopefully will be submitted um, within a month or two. There's also work that I wanted to mention on um, hydrological forecasting. So there's workflows associated um, with hydrological forecasting. This is work that Louise Anal is doing in collaboration with Andy Wood. Um, where we're um, taking a lot of the work that we've done um, to develop models and um, then um, using um, formalized workflows um, to um, produce um, streamflow forecasts using this information. So that's uh, um, taking output um, from numerical weather prediction models and um, climate outlooks, et cetera, and you know, um, pumping it, pumping it through the workflow where the model is run up to the start of the forecast period to estimate based on the initial conditions and then um, run into the future um, using different forecast uh, forecast products. And um, so those, those workflows are under development as well and um, being made available to the community. Wanted to pivot um, to talk about some of the work on parameter estimation. Um, so there's two main themes here. The first is sensitivity analysis to understand model behavior and also work on large domain parameter estimation. So if we talk about what we what we mean um, by um, parameters, we can think about the hierarchical typology of a model. Um, so this is um, a picture that we showed in the SUMA paper, um, where um, if we're just focusing on the on on the inside, and um, the model architecture um, has got um, the um, state variables that we're interested in. So in this system, we're interested in evolving um, the temperature of the vegetation canopy, the snow and the soil in terms of our representation of thermodynamics and um, evolving the storage of water and the, and the canopy, the snow, the soil and the aquifer in terms of our representation of, of hydrology. So um, the architecture is the state variables that we've selected um, in order to advance our model simulations. Um, the temporal evolution of each of those state variables is dependent on the fluxes at the boundaries of the control volumes that we define within our system. Um, so those are on the, on the outside here. Um, so the model parameterizations are the functions to des describe the relationship between model states and model fluxes. Um, we can have parameterizations of evapotranspiration, surface runoff, infiltration, et cetera. And the model parameters that we have are at a, at a lower level, so those are the adjustable coefficients in our model equations. Um, in complex models, the parameters are distributed throughout the code at different points in the workflow. Um, so they can be at the point of transfer functions, which are used to translate geophysical attributes to model parameters. For example, translating um, the um, leaf area index um, to the canopy storage capacity. Um, they can be lookup tables um, to describe parameters um, for different um, vegetation classes or um, different soil classes. Um, it can sometimes be hard-coded parameters, um, which um, would need to be re um, removed or nameless parameters, which could be um, spatially constant um, for, the, um, for the model simulation. So implementing parameter estimation requires careful attention and more complex models to different elements of the model workflow um, so that the parameters can be adjusted in a meaningful way. Let's work on um, sensitivity analysis, um, different, different types of sensitivity analysis one at a time analysis or out analysis can be to put to one parameter at a time. Um, there can be different methods um, for local sensitivity analysis. 
um, um, where we're looking at the sensitivity at a single point in the parameter space or um, global sensitivity analysis where we're looking at the parameter sensitivity across multiple points in the parameter space. Um, so that could include variance decomposition methods such as SOBOL, et cetera. Um, this, um, what we're really interested in sensitivity analysis is to understand how the model behaves across large geographical regions. And so um, what we're showing here is an earlier paper by Steve Markstrom um, looking at um, the different parameters um, that control different hydrological, um, hydrological states and fluxes, well, hydrological fluxes in this case, um, across the contiguous United States. There's work, work ongoing to, uh, to extend that across North America. Um, the work um, from PCIC is uh, um, focused on two objectives. Um, the first objective is to how to use sensitivity analysis knowledge to guide process-based parameter estimation across large domains and how the efficiency of the calibration process is impacted by the number of parameters and the type of parameters. So this is work that's been done by Samal Larabi and Marcus Schnorbis. Um, they're focused on the Peace, Fraser, and Columbia River basins, and the results um, that they've asked me to share with you today are uh, based on, on five basins um, within, those, uh, within these model, model domain. They're interested in objective functions that describe um, different aspects of the hydrograph. Um, so uh, the objective functions that they're interested in is three objective functions um, for stream flow, which is the Klingupta efficiency, um, the nash shutcliffe efficiency, and the heteroscedastic maximum likelihood estimator. Um, for evapotranspiration is the bell-shaped membership function. Um, for snow-covered areas, the Klingupta efficiency and um, the glacier storage, um, where it's applicable um, in these basins is the bell-shaped membership function. Um, they've got, they've performed three experiments. Um, the first is the baseline experiment where the same parameters are adjusted regardless of basin characteristics and are selected based on user experience and previous sensitivity analysis studies. Um, the second is the highly sensitive experiment um, where they're adjusting only the highly sensitive parameters um, that were identified based on basin specific parameter sensitivity and the sensitive experiment where they're adjusting um, all sensitive parameters um, that are identified based on the basin specific parameter sensitivity analysis. Um, so these are the, the five basins here. Um, and this is showing the parameters per experiment um, where the baseline experiment has got fewer parameters um, the highly sensitive experiment has got slightly more parameters um, and the sensitive experiment has got a lot more parameters. So the calibration is, um, is multi-objective um, using those um, um, objective functions that I described before. What I'm showing in this plot here is, is the five basins um, where they applied uh, um, um, their method. So that's from the spatial map that I showed a couple of slides ago. Um, um, the y-axis is um, the um, individual um, performance metrics um, that were used in the um, multi-objective optimization. Um, so this is the Klingupta efficiency applied to stream flow. Um, and um, the um, different colors here, uh, um, what parameters um, were being used. Um, is so um, the blue is the baseline, the orange is um, the highly sensitive parameters, and the green is where we're um, calibrating, uh, calibrating all parameters. So, um, so what we're seeing here is in a, a lot of basins where we're calibrating a lot more parameters, the performance of stream flow actually diminishes. Um, I, th I think that's um, because we've got a much more um, high, highly dimensional parameter space and um, it's um, it's um, difficult to constrain that um, based on based on stream flow alone. Um, when we're going to um, some other variables, so the Bell membership function for evapotranspiration, um, the best results um, that we're getting uh, when we're um, calibrating more parameters. Um, so um, we're looking at the green here has got um, a, a, a better objective function here. And um, so that's suggesting that some of the parameters, some of the highly sensitive parameters 
um, um, were necessary to get better simulations of ET, but that's coming at the expense of the simulations of stream flow. As we're moving forward here, um, we're looking at how we can pull together, you know, the different different elements of um, the, and the um, parameter inference community and push forward to um, process-based parameter estimation. So we can see that, you know, there's different um, um, research thrusts um, that are going on. Um, so people can be focusing on information content and asking um, when we're looking at um, geophysical attributes and using geophysical attributes to predict hydrological signatures of behavior, how much information content is there in the um, geophysical attributes to, produ to predict the hydrological signatures. Um, we can do um, sensitivity analysis um, to understand how perturbations and um, model parameters affect the hydrological signatures. And then we can look at um, regionalization studies um, to um, regionalize um, the, geof um, the, um, the model parameters based on knowledge of um, geophysical attributes. So those are different and somewhat orthogonal ways of looking, looking at the problem. Um, but it's often done um, using statistical methodologies um, with a lot of um, process inside. So there's um, still some key science questions that need to be addressed here. So how can we study um, process interactions across timescales? Um, so how can vegetation growth, you know, um, understanding vegetation growth affect the model parameters and how can we include that in our models? Um, that's associated with um, um, understanding how um, properties define processes, so how um, 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 slow variations in the system can affect um, the higher frequency variations in the system. And um, the example here is how landscape evolution defines the storage and transmission properties of the landscape. There's lots and lots of examples how vegetation change um, um, defines um, um, vegetation fluxes, you know, things like that. So there's still a, um, still a lot of work um, to do on um, parameter estimation, especially you know to understand um, the relative advantage of different methods, um, um, the advantages and limitations of different methods for large domain parameter estimation. And we've got a postdoc, um, Hong Li Lu, um, who's um, joined us a few months ago, who's um, beginning to work hard on those topics, and um, we should have some results on that soon. Wanted to um, pivot to model evaluation and talk about um, some of our work on traditional performance metrics and um, developing um, comprehensive benchmarking strategies. So our work on um, traditional metrics, we um, published a paper in Water Resources Research um, a few months ago on um, the abuse of performance metrics and hydrological modeling. Um, so I've got a slide on this next. Um, what we were um, focused on here was um, that a lot of the um, traditional performance metrics have got um, large sampling uncertainty. Um, we use the non-overlapping block bootstrap method to obtain probability distributions and associated tolerance estimates of the Nash Tuckler efficiency and the Kling um, Gupta efficiency, and use jackknife after bootstrap method to obtain estimates of the standard error of those bootstrap tolerance intervals. So the thing that we did um, um, over the past few months, or that Kevin Shook did actually, is um, developed an R package called Gumboot. Um, which implements the methods in this paper. And I think Kevin's going to be talking about this at the um, Canadian Water Resources Association meeting in Canmore um, in, um, in a few months. Um, I'm going to touch on this on the next slide. We quantified the sampling uncertainty and system scale performance metrics across a large sample of catchments. And um, the work highlights um, the obvious um, but ignored abuses of performance metrics that contaminate the conclusions of many hydrological modeling studies. As I mentioned, we published this in water resources research um, just a few months ago. Um, the key figure in the paper that I will talk about here is um, this is the um, uncertainty in um, the Nash Shutcliffe score and the top plot and the y axis and um, the Klingupta efficiency and the bottom plot. And what I'm showing here is um, in the orange is um, two times the standard error. Um, so this is um, for 670 sites in the CAMELS database. Um, um, the red is uh, two times um, the standard error estimated with the, with the bootstrap. 
and um, the black is um, the co confidence interval or the tolerance interval, which is the 95th percentile subtracted from the um, fifth percentile. Um, so this is showing that when we're looking at 671 camel sites, um, the uncertainty in um, the Klingupta efficiency and the Nash Shutcliffe efficiency may be greater than um, 0.1. Um, for um, many of these sites. Um, so that um, can call into question um, the conclusions from um, many previous modeling studies. Um, of course, you know, we're um, interested in um, Fidelius models. We're not only interested in accuracy, um, but um, in terms of um, the minimizing the discrepancies between model simulations and observations, we're also interested in fidelity um, to define the extent to which a model faithfully represents the processes and the region where it's applied. Um, so the um, 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 benchmarking strategy that we've got incorporates a few different areas. You know, the first is laugh tests. We also published this paper a, a few months ago. The laugh tests are really just to evaluate if the um, model equations are implemented correctly. Um, so the example that I like to give um, for this group is our laugh test um, for water movement through snow. Um, so here I'm showing um, snow initialized um, um, as um, ripe snow, refrozen snow and fresh snow and rainfall for three hours it, um, is put on top of a one meter snowpack. Um, this is based on um, the numerical experiments from Colbeck um, back in the 70s. We extended these numerical experiments and were able to provide analytical solutions of the volumetric liquid water content in the snowpack um, at every point in space and time. Um, so the left set of plots are showing the analytical solutions um, for this laugh test um, uh, for ripe snow in the top plot, refrozen snow in the middle plot, and fresh snow on the bottom plot and um, the corresponding um, model simulations, um, which match um, the analytical solutions quite well. We're also able to um, the, um, use the analytical solutions to estimate the outflow um, from the snowpack. And um, here I'm showing the correspondence between the analytical solutions and the numerical solutions for ripe snow, top plot, refrozen snow middle plot and fresh snow on the bottom plot, um, showing that there's um, that there's good correspondence. We've got a series of laugh tests um, that we published in the paper a, a, a few months ago, and, um, and those are um, designed to activate um, different parts of the model and ensure that the equations are implemented correctly. Um, moving beyond that, um, there's a focus on model-based um, evaluation. So focus on um, continents, um, research basins, and um, point, um, point scale, um, multivariate simulations um, where we're interested in different processes. And, um, and the data that we have is dependent on the process and the scale. So we may be able to use satellite observations of snow cover at the coarser spatial, at the larger spatial um, scales or for the larger spatial domains and um, point measurements as we're moving um, towards the um, lower spatial domains. A key advance here is the focus on the research basins. And this is the work um, that um, um, Al Petronero has been done with, uh, been doing with um, Prabin Rikoya and now Shivan Gahari um, in collaboration with the data team. Um, so um, what they're um, developing is um, dashboards um, for each of, for a number of research basins, Baker Creek, Northwest Territories, Brightwater Creek in Saskatchewan, Marmot Creek in Alberta, St. Denis um, in Saskatoon, and um, Wolf Creek in um, the Yukon Territory. And um, they've got um, written descriptions of each of these basins, um, climate graphs, um, flow description graphs, um, additional information, um, uh, highlights and shortfalls of the data sets, um, the geospatial data that's necessary um, to run a model, the meteorological data that's necessary to run a model, um, validation data, and comments on the continuity of observations. And um, the goal is to run um, a, a, a few models in these test beds um, to provide um, process-based benchmarks as to how well the model's working. Um, extending this, and this is work that Walter Knurbens um, now, now um, pivoting to, 
is to extend his work um, to continental domain signatures. So here's an example of snowpack. Um, there's some um, simple, like more um, empirical signatures, which is looking at the relationship um, between effective mean snow depth and um, the um, amplitude of, of, of the temperature. Um, and um, what um, this is work from Drew Slater as, a, as an empirical benchmark looking at relationships across variables, showing the response that we're getting from multiple models and the response that we can get um, from the observations. And um, then also um, like different large sample data sets. What I'm showing here is the CAMELS data set, which is used um, for model evaluation across the contiguous United States. And Vautican Urban's in the midst of extending this um, to um, provide a CAMELS data set across North America. Um, so it's an extension in space, and then it's also an extension in process representation. The original CAMELS data set is just lumped um, for all of these catchments. And, and what Vout is doing is producing a spatially distributed version of um, the CAMELS data set across all, um, all unregulated basins in North America. He's calling that CAMELS spat. So to, to sum up and talk about where we're at, made a lot of progress, um, but still a lot of work to be done. Um, for, the, for the workflows, um, our goal has been to improve the efficiency of continental domain model implementation tasks. Um, I think that's been quite successful. Um, Vout has um, developed his workflow across North America. Um, and the paper's been submitted for that. Um, and um, elements of his workflow have been used um, by other modeling groups um, within GWF um, and um, other modeling groups um, outside of GWF. And um, the workflow is being taken uh, by Go Chung and um, being applied globally. Where this work is going now is that we've got a new postdoc, um, Bart van Osnabrugge. And, and what Bart is focused on is the um, extension of Vouter's workflow um, to multiple models. What Vouter did in this task was um, have a um, generalized workflow that was applied to a single model. What Bart's doing is um, extending that and showing how that um, generalized workflow can be applied to multiple models. And we're hoping that this is going to become standard in the work that's happening um, um, across multiple countries. Um, the um, work on um, parameter estimation, um, a lot of the work on sensitivity analysis and um, multi-objective parameter estimation by the PICIT group, you know, has been has been has been very good. Um, and our group has also developed a new sensitivity analysis um, method, a computationally frugal com um, sensitivity analysis um, called Viscous that um, Hong Lee has been extending. Um, the work on large domain parameter estimation is um, still getting off the ground. Um, so Hong Lee's at the moment um, doing some work parallel to the PCAT group to understand um, um, large domain um, sensitivity analysis and um, understand the behavior of models across, across large domains. And, and then um, that work will feed into understanding the advantages and limitations of alternative um, large domain sensitivity methods. And then, you know, some process work there to connect parameters to processes um, to um, begin to look at parameter estimation or focus more on parameter estimation from a um, process perspective than as a statistical exercise. Um, the um, work on um, model evaluation, um, the last test paper is now published, so um, we're um, moving beyond that now. Um, a lot of work um, based on process-based model evaluation. Um, the key effort is the work that Al and Prabin and Shivan and the data team have been leading um, um, to um, look at the um, 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 process-based model evaluation and research basins. Now the work um, that um, Vout is focused on um, for um, process-based model evaluation, you know, across um, larger geographical domains. Um, we haven't um, done much on um, formal benchmarking yet um, to um, explicitly um, define our expectations of model performance. There's a few papers that we've published over the past few years that provide framing from that problem that we can build on as we're moving forward. Um, 
So I'll end there after about um, 45 minutes and um, see if there's any questions. Um, thanks very much again um, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, perfect. Uh, we are on time for questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing screen. Yes. Yep. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Before we go to the uh, question part, I would like to apologize. Uh, there was an issue in the beginning. Apparently, there was a generated team link in the invite, which some people took. And then we realized that for after a couple of minutes, and then people come back to the Zoom link. Uh, we don't know how that was generated. So that's to be diagnosed. But uh, our apologies for that. Uh, Joy and I will look into that. Uh, let's go to the question and answer. Uh, we have uh, questions uh, from uh, John, which uh, uh, the first question I go, uh, it's about Merit Hydro. Uh, so Merit Hydro seems uh, to show realistic stream network in the mountains, but the prairies and Canadian Shield are dominated by ponds and lakes that are poorly connected uh, variably or not connected at all by stream network and highly uncertain surface storage. Uh, uh, how will your special intelligence group deal with uh, routing and contributing area uh, in these regions? Well, I have a request from John, but I wait for your answer, Martin. <laughs> so. um, sorry, Shivan, you had a request from John? Yes, my request from John is that please provide us with high resolution LIDAR and the problem is solved. So, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, um, John, this is a huge problem, and um, it's um, not something that's resolved by these global scale networks. There's other problems with these global scale networks and the way that they're representing endorheic basins, etc. Um, I th think there needs to be um, more analysis of the um, terrain in these basins and the work that Kevin Shook's doing on his historic um, relationships I think is is really important that um, this hasn't this hasn't been addressed yet yeah yeah um, but you know there needs to be some systematic corrections you know some other databases that are available um, has um, connection um, from all of these basins um, to the coast um, so you're looking at some of the databases and there's no indirect basins um, in the South Saskatchewan at all. Um, not saying that Merit Hydro is is perfect, um, but it's a it's a it's well, far from perfect. Um, but it's a it's a known problem. Uh, it's what what exists globally. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, I still hope for a, for a higher resolution. The <laughs> For the prairies, that would be certainly helpful, uh, because of course these uh, data set like Merit Hydro are based on rather coarse, which might not be suitable for prairies. Uh, the, I, I go for the second question to James Craig. Uh, researchers have been using analytical solution as benchmark tests for numerical models for decades. What makes a laugh test uh, distinct from classical benchmark evaluation? Well, a lot of them are the classical benchmark evaluations. So, and um, this is used in the subsurface community a lot. You know, you've seen the paper by Celia. Um, so that's one of our laugh tests. You know, um, another of our laugh tests um, from the subsurface community is um, and a couple from the Vanderbilt paper that I'm sure that you're familiar with. You know, the Colbeck is a is another example. Um, um, there's some of them are based on lab experiments. You know, they're no different. Um, um, what we're what we're seeing when we're moving to the global modeling community is that those analytical benchmarks aren't used as commonly, and um, that the models aren't um, um, implemented as well as they could be. Um, so it's effectively James uh, um, communication, you know, from one community to another, saying, "Hey, you know, uh, let's implement our equations correctly. Let's check that they're implemented correctly, so that we can move on." Yeah. Uh, maybe a question from my side, uh, does laugh test more emphasize on data as well? Because I think uh, there is comparison of analytical solution and numerical solution, which hopefully match, but are they also following the observation? Is it something that 
uh, you had in mind for the last no. Time, so that's really no we take it uh, so it's it's just like can we can we have a check that the equations that we've implemented in the model are actually implemented correctly oh I see. that's that's all it's doing um that next stage is comparison against observations yeah i see yeah and um I th and i think that question is probably leading into john's next question yeah so which is uh john's next question we know that a cool -back model for water percolation through snow is badly wrong because it ignores heterogeneous flow through snow uh, flow uh, fingers ice layers etc what is the point of testing a new model against an old model that we know is quite incorrect uh, why reproduce the error of the past yeah so all we're doing here john i think as you know is um, to um, come up with some tests that check that the equations that we've implemented are implemented correctly and um, sometimes we need to make some simplifications in order to um, make those tests an example is that um, one of our tests is um, um, using kinematics um, flow for subsurface flow across a hill slope um, so um, we're simplifying our model so um, um, we've um, got the kinematic flow and then we're able to use that laugh test um, so the snow example there if we're ignoring heterogeneity um, is the capillary term so if we're using um, Richard's equation to simulate the storage and transmission of um, water through the snowpack um, in order to use the analytical solutions we'd have to um, um, turn off the capillary term um, in, in, in order to test that that's okay um, so they're very restrictive um, they're um, you know, like um, simplified tests and that things are implemented okay um, but um, they're they um, not extensible to more real world processes. Yep. Um, the interesting story on that actually is um, that um, the snow therm model, um, John, I'm sure that you remember this, um, it was popular, you know, in the um, end, end of the last century. Um, they compared um, the um, model simulations um, to the Kolbeck tests, um, to the Kolbeck analytical solution, and said that they didn't match. Um, and they said, well, you know, we think that our model simulation is better. Um, the problem was that the Kolbeck solution was wrong. Um, um, it didn't um, really complete the solution. And then when we completed the solution, you will see that our results are different than what's published in the Kolbeck paper, um, the correspondence um, between the um, numerical simulations and the analytical so solutions, you know, are much more similar. And um, um, so, you know, that's that's published now. So I, st I still think that they they're useful, um, but they've definitely got limitations. Um, they're only able to evaluate idealized scenarios. Uh, I hope. Uh... I think it answered John's question. Uh, we wait for maybe, um, we don't have any other question here. So, um, yeah, so we can uh, maybe wrap up. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, uh, for the presentation. It was, uh, yeah, John said, thank you, yeah. And thank you everybody for uh, being here on this webinar. Uh, so uh, I just want to make an announcement that our next uh, GWF thematic uh, webinar will be on March 3rd, 2022. Uh, Professor Roy Brauer from University of Waterloo will uh, talk about advances in hydroeconomics. So uh, by that, I would like to again thank uh, Martin very much for uh, giving this very, very interesting uh, presentation and uh, updating us with the uh, advancement in geospatial intelligence. And thank everybody for uh, being here uh, this hour with us and see you in the next uh, webinar of this series. Thank you very much. Bye.